Strategic Treasurer currently has two live surveys open through July of 2022. They're on different aspects of payments. Virtual Card Solution Survey with MasterCard is a quick 10-minute survey on challenges, expectations, and value drivers of virtual card programs. Global Payments with CorePay is one of our long-standing premier surveys researching FX, cross-border transfers, and new payment technologies. Please visit strategictreasure.com slash surveys to learn more. Hello and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury Podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. I am Pushpendra Mehta and my guests for today are Jack Large, editor of CTM File and Craig Jeffrey, managing partner at Strategic Treasurer. Welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, Jack and Craig. This week, we are covering six stories touching on three themes. We'll discuss inflation and interest rate hikes in Canada and the US and a weakening Chinese economy. Risk management and concerns around Italy and U.S. corporations not keeping the pace and banking, where Citigroup continues to cut out underperforming services and purchase high growth areas. You can look up these news articles on CTM file or by their links in our show notes. Gentlemen, let's begin our discussion with the first section that revolves around inflation and diverse economies. The Bank of Canada has made the most aggressive rate hike since 1998 by raising its benchmark interest rate by one percentage point on Wednesday to drive inflation downward. The U.S. inflation also surged to a four-decade high in June with the consumer price index jumping by 9.1% year-over-year according to fresh data released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It is widely expected that the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise its benchmark interest rate by at least 75 basis points at its upcoming meeting on July 26th and 27th. Craig, my question to you is, do you think the interest rate hikes and inflation will affect corporate earnings and slow down economic growth in the U.S. and Canada? Well, I think inflation is going to present uh, quite a number of of challenges. Uh, The economy might be even more impacted in that these two uh, have a feedback loop, one on the other. I think what uh, the Bank of Canada is doing here is they've recognized and stated that it's clearly, the economy is clearly in excess demand. And they uh, bumped up the rate above what the expectation was of 75 basis points. They moved it up a full point. So this is uh, an attempt to get back even with what's occurring in the economy in Canada it's not that much different uh, from the U.S. and quite a bit of the rest of the Western world here. So volatility and unexpected activities are harder on corporate treasure. So I think this is a little bit of a rough sailing that everyone needs to pay attention to. In Europe, the Bank of England, for example, one of the advisors saying that they think there's going to be an increase in the U.K. of 2% in the base rate. And inflation is going to be significantly higher than Canada's was predicting of 4.6%. We think it's going to be much more than that. So rate hikes are not going away. They're going to increase, in my opinion. Yeah, the expectation that the Fed was a little more uh, verbose and much of the expectation is a, a full point hike, or certainly a significant portion of economists think a full point hike in the U.S. too. So uh, that seems to be uh, across the board. And moving forward, China recorded its weakest economic growth rate in more than two years. The world's second largest economy grew at the slowest pace since the first quarter of 2020 when the pandemic first erupted and the world saw its first COVID-19 lockdown come into force in the Chinese city of Wuhan. 
In addition, the tens of thousands of people around the country are withholding payments on their mortgages. The mortgage boycott shows how deep China's property crisis grows. Jack, my question to you is, would a prolonged slowdown in China have substantial global spillovers? Are you concerned? Yes, the answer is yes. The spillover will increase the recession around the world. I think there's a global recession starting. China is is unique and particularly in their trying to have zero COVID. But the overall impact will be far greater than even the Chinese think. So, Craig, are you feeling very or concerned about the ramifications to the world economy, just as Jack is? The fact that uh, China makes up uh, a little bit north of 18% of the global product, domestic product, is uh, significant. So any any major impact to China, the U.S., or any of the G7 countries can have a ripple effect. And you know, China, like Jack was saying, shuts down things really hard to you know, get to zero, and they're supplying much of the world with certain components and uh, goods. Uh, this is uh, undoubtedly impacting supply chains and and other economies in very challenging ways, right? The demand is higher than the, the supply. And part of the reason for the constrained supply is are these actions in China and, and in other countries too, but pr- predominantly by China. So this is a big contributor to what we're seeing. Our next section revolves around risk management. Is it a cause for concern? As new political turmoil engulfs Italy, the European Central Bank or the ECB's new instrument to combat excessive increases in euro area borrowing costs may be put to that test sooner than anticipated with a new bond instrument to potentially roll out early. Jack, do you think the new bond instrument is seen as a safety net to prevent high inflation when at risk? rather than a measure to help governments in crisis? I think it's a combination of both, but it reflects the dynamics of the European market with vastly different economies. Italy is out of control. Germany is much more under control, but starting to have concerns. The new bond is actually, I don't think, going to work because trying to solve the Italian problem with this type of bond isn't going to work. It's never worked. I see it just a reflection of a much greater stress on the euro and the European community as a whole. It's not going to solve the problem in Italy, which is what it was intended to do. The second story in the risk management section is about a new report titled The 2022 State of Risk Oversight, an Overview of Enterprise Risk Management Practices, a study by the American Institute of CPAs and North Carolina State University's Enterprise Risk Management Initiative. This report states that most finance executives in the U.S. do not believe their organization's risk management processes provide strategic advantage. Further, the study revealed that less than 20% of organizations believe their risk management processes provided strategic advantage. According to the report, this is surprising given most leaders understand that risk and return are inseparable realities. Craig, do the findings in the report surprise you? As I read this report, there was two things that came to mind after consuming the whole set of information first, when it says they don't believe the organization's risk management processes provide strategic advantage, 63% said no or minimal advantage. That's a bit of the glass half empty when you compare yourself to others. If others are keeping up, then that's really not that much of a issue, right? Because you're keeping up with other organizations if that's what the comparison is. So that, uh, that could perhaps be seen as a bit of an overstatement. However, when we dig deeper, it's like, Three quarters, 74% of board of directors say senior executive management in risk oversight needs to increase, that there needs to be significant changes to things like crisis management planning, business continuity, some of these other factors. So it might be that people are keeping pace with their peers generally, but board of directors are saying this is not adequate for 
the type of headwinds that we face in the risk environment. So there needs to be an increased level of risk management. That's quite notable because as we've gone back several years since the start of COVID, the, the testing of risk management plans has generally proven to be pretty well in some areas, but it's also exposed other weaknesses. And I think this is trying to get at those areas that haven't been addressed as thoroughly as before. And especially as we see the economy, economic issues tighten, rates rising, tightening on some of the commodities markets, this is a, you know, overdue. I'm afraid this report for me is a typical accountancy report. The real issue that it doesn't really address is that global warming is the biggest single thing in the planet and this biggest single impact. And it almost doesn't mention it. It's appalling. Moving from one aspect of appalling to the other, at Cyber Week 2022, the 12th edition of Israel's largest cybersecurity event that was hosted in Tel Aviv, ransomware is still cybersecurity's biggest challenge, as was evinced in the Cyber Week 2022 event. 60% of organizations were hit with ransomware last year, according to the SOFO State of Ransomware 2022 report. The cyber attacks proliferating and cyber criminals continuing to exploit vulnerabilities faster than ever. Lindy Cameron, CEO of the UK's National Cybersecurity Center, states that ransomware still remains cybersecurity's biggest challenge in a recently published tech story in Venture Beat. Jack, my question to you is, is ransomware being compounded by the lack of cooperation between institutions, technology companies, government and its agencies, including uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine? What more can be done to ensure that there will be less incidents of ransomware? There's clearly not been enough done. And when we had ransomware in the UK, the NHS was rescued by a very clever programmer who understood the basics of ransomware and how it works. And the problem with that story is that there are far too few people like that around to be able to manage this. And so the lack of cooperation multiplies the problem. I think ransomware is, as you say, an appalling risk, and I don't see any cooperation anytime soon, I'm afraid, that is meaningful cooperation. Craig, as a society where cyber attacks can be repelled, I know Strategic Treasurer has done work within the realm of security. What is your opinion? How can ransomware be weeded out or reduced? The recognition that this is not only an ongoing attack, but increasingly sophisticated and fully automated How else are 60% of organizations being hit by this when this has been around for multiple years and you combine that with the exfiltration of data, the increase in the ransom that's happening, you see that this is an ongoing issue. So it's the defenses from a system perspective, ability to restore, also the ability to keep people trained and current on cyber defenses. Everyone is responsible for cyber defenses to some extent. Everyone needs to be upgraded, just like our our systems need to be patched. How this is going to be done is training of people and stronger defenses on the the system side. And I think one of the things that we're going to see, just like we see scores for the financial health of organizations, different rating agencies, NRSROs give health ratings. I think we're going to see more and more ratings uh, come out for how are your cyber defenses, how are your public assets do you have everything you know, current and up to speed from your websites to headers to your control of email, the use of these different uh, tools? Uh, that's going to become much more prevalent and much more public as the only way of making sure that participants in the digital economy are maintaining a proper form of inoculation against uh, the worst of these. Yeah, one of these findings from the ransomware for the NHS was that actually people were using 20 to 30-year-old versions of 
Microsoft Windows. That sort of lack of investment in fundamental infrastructure can't go on. It's got, it's got to be attacked and really government and business are going to have to bear the cost. It's unsustainable if we don't. The next section up for discussion pertains to banking. Citigroup has implemented a strategy to increase investor returns by cutting out underperforming services and purchasing high growth areas as reported in the American Banker. Citi's Treasury and Trade Solutions Division, a part of the Institutional Clients Group, which assists global companies with their treasury, payments and commerce needs, increased 33% year over year to US $3 billion in second quarter of 2022. Citigroup CEO Jane Fraser said the increase produced the strongest quarter this firm has had in a decade. Craig, what do you make of Citi's treasury and trade solutions performance? Even trillion dollar banks need to make decisions about the allocation of capital and what's what's performing. So the the idea that they've you know sold uh, their Australian franchise last month, they're closing others. Banamex, the retail side, I think that's uh, that's underway of being I'll just call it divested or, or sold off. Um, and then they're pointing to areas that are growing more rapidly. If you look at the growth of payments and their focus on the treasury and trade solutions, that's a, those are really bright spots at Citibank and among others. The growth of payments, the the broader use of some of the technology there is growing rapidly. And so they're selling assets that are performing okay or solidly and pouring money and investment into the areas that are having outsized uh, growth and expect to have outsized growth for multiple years. So this is a wise decision on their part to focus on these on these areas. I think we're going to see more of that. We see that we've seen that with uh, some of the largest French banks. We see that with Citi and others are, you have to make decisions. You have, you have limited access to capital. You need to get a return. Um, and so where do you focus? What can you do the best at? And others will fill in the, in the spots to, uh, uh, to fit their strategy and their growth plans. Underlining of how successful and important that sector is of treasury and trade and payments is the fact that Goldman Sachs have got a whole new initiative in that area, focusing on exactly the same area. They too are moving strategies and focus. It's inevitable. Finally, I would like to wrap up this conversation by seeking your opinion on your choice for the biggest to the most important story of the past week and why. Jack, can I start with you? I'm afraid it's, I'm repeating myself, but what we haven't mentioned here is the elephant in the room, which is global climate change. The head of the United Nations had a speech last week when he said, we've either got to get collective action or it's collective suicide. It really is that serious. And Treasury has a part to play in it. Craig? My top story or top theme is going to be the headwinds that we're facing on the, on the economy now. Canada's 1% rate hike is certainly notable, um, given that it's, I think it's been like 20, almost a, a quarter of a century since they increased the rate that much. I think the biggest one for me is because of the size of the economy, uh, the U.S. inflation rate, 41 year record. And this is being treated and counted differently. And so I think that's a sign of the world's largest economy, uh, what we're seeing there. Uh, there's certainly spillover to the rest of the globe. And I think that's probably the biggest head when we have um, climate wise or other, that's a, a significant uh, economic impact that will spill over to other areas of, of uh, our lives and our businesses. My choice for the story of the week is the story around China recording its weakest economic growth rate. I probably see it as a crisis of confidence and Somewhere I feel that their economy is their chink in their armor. So in that sense, I'm concerned about the ramifications to the world economy and the global spillover that both of you mentioned. So I would choose that as the story of the week. Before I end this discussion, I would like to convey my 
Thank you. A very big thank you to you, Jack and Craig, and to our CTM file audience for joining us on this edition of Open Treasury. As a summary of our discussion, we will be putting up a mind map of today's stories. Also, please subscribe and look in the show notes for the article links. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. For more information, visit ctmfile.com.